Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hi, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with family and friends and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, from his hearing loss, from radiation to his brain tumor, and then subsequently from complications from his brain tumor. I only care for ears. I'm the E of ENT, and I've performed over 10,000 ear surgeries, and I've taken care of many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Center. I'm also the author of the book, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. Today, I have Dave Kemp. He is the business development director for at Oak Tree Products and a podcast host of the Future Ear Radio and This Week in Hearing. He podcasts about hearables and all the cool new use cases that they're able to support, such as voice-assisted integration, biometric monitoring, and machine learning. His goal is to help curate all of the interesting news and information that pertains to various uh, topics converging around the ear. This episode is also sponsored by Oak Tree given that that's who he works for, and we're excited to have him here. Hey, Dave, thanks for coming on to the podcast. It's great to see you. Absolutely, Mark. Thanks for having me. Sure. So tell me a little bit about how you know um, how you got to Oak Tree and then how you got to having a podcast uh, on, on the ear. Sure. Um, so Oak Tree Products is a family company. I'm actually second generation uh, family business. So my parents started Oak Tree, uh, the two of them did back in 1993. So I was born in 89. I'm the youngest of three. And uh, so they had three kids under 10 years old, started a company. um, And, you know, basically the idea of Oak Tree was to become a distributor uh, to the hearing healthcare professional. And so um, I've worked, you know, in Oak Tree as the janitor and and, in every single department here throughout my life um, as a family business. And that's when they said, Dave, empty the trash, right? (laughs) Exactly. And so (laughs) as a, uh, you know, as a family business that it it becomes sort of like another family member. And so through osmosis, I've always sort of been um, in tune with what's going on in this industry. And so I ended up joining Oak Tree full time, um, along with my brother, who's three years older, he's uh, now the president of the company. um, And, um, you know, wanted to to kind of embark on on this and, and finally kind of fully immerse myself into this world. So my background is, um, I graduated the University of Kansas um, in the journalism school. So hence, you know, I kind of got into the media side of this industry. I, I had a real passion for blogging and then the blog eventually evolved into the podcast. Um, so blog initially was Future Ear. And then I started Future Ear Radio two years after that. Um, and as you said in the intro, really the whole point has always been like, you know, right when I entered in 2016, 2017 was really where we started to see the um, made for iPhone hearing aids start to really pick up steam, the app economy starting to be built around those. And I thought this is super interesting. It allows for me to kind of tap into my passion of technology and my passion of, of like media and reading and writing and, and now podcasting. Um, and so that's kind of the origin of how my whole blog came to be. And then the podcast was this intersection of media and my passion for technology. And then having like our sleepy little industry here of, of the world of hearing aids and audiology suddenly being at the focal point of so much consumer innovation that's taking place right now that I just find to be fascinating. Yeah, that's great. And so, so, uh, you know, let's explore some of the, like, so in terms of your time, like what are some of the, rather than what are the most current stories, we'll get to that what are your favorite stories? Like, so like, so some of the things you've covered, I mean, I I will tell you from my podcast, there are just some times where I'm like talking to someone who's like, wow, I'm learning so much. I mean, they were giving to me. So that that's one of the things I love about. I I mean, you can probably relate to this too, as a podcast host, I think um, like a a plug for just podcasting in general is that you get an opportunity to talk to so many experts in so many different fields. And so it really starts to kind of round out your worldview um, because you're just constantly immersing yourself in, in people that are so they, they've spent so much time, um, and they've 
gained this hard-earned wisdom and then they kind of impart that on you. And so you're just kind of absorbing wisdom left and right. And so for me, like um, I kind of had like these broad stroke ideas of of what some of the big trends were going to be as it relates to in the ear devices as they became more computerized. Like that was always kind of the the macro macro level theme was like, look, you know, if you uh, I have like a few favorite authors that I've read, um, and you know, a lot of what they've always said is that like like Chris Anderson from 3D Robotics, for example, is a huge person that I I look up to um, because he's been writing about a lot of these like really macro level trends and how they apply to consumer technology since the early 2000s. And when I was in high school, I remember him reading, I remember reading this article that he wrote all about um, the peace dividends of the smartphone wars. And, And really what he was referring to was like, because of the just sheer proliferation and economies of scale that have gone along with the fact that now there are like upwards of 5 billion smartphones out in the wild today, the supply chain of all those components, which comprises all other consumer devices from drones to hearing aids, um, are just beginning, are, are being innovated on at a breakneck speed as well. And so if you, if you kind of follow that out, what that really, the, the major implication of that is that the devices, like what you, if you lift up the hood and you look at what's going on underneath, you see that the chips are getting so significantly better. The ways in which the Bluetooth radios work, um, it's all the guts of the device that are really fueling all this innovation. And so you kind of look at it today and you have this marvel of, of engineering, which is this tiny little hearing aid and all these different in-the-ear devices. And, and what we're seeing is like, these things really are becoming standalone computers in their own rights. And so I I would say that as I become more immersed in the engineering side of things, I'm not an engineer by trade and I'm not like well suited for that, but just by osmosis and learning through all of these experts that are really helping me to understand what's the difference between an ASIC chip and a DSP chip. Why are DSP chips suddenly now reaching parity with ASIC chips. What is the implications of that? You know, we know that hearing aids historically have always run on these ASIC chips. I know what DSP is digital signal processing. What's ASIC? ASIC is basically like, um, I, I actually don't even know what it stands for, but it's uh, effectively, it is the um, type of chip that is, you you can only program it like at the hard at the at the hardware so level, it's not adaptable. You can't exactly. You can't it's not adaptable. It. You can't put a new app in it. Exactly, and so that is ultimately what is one of the big cost drivers for hearing aids. And so, as you start to kind of unwind this stuff, and you realize, oh, okay. So, in the past, like DSP chips had these serious limitations. Like battery life was a major one. Well, now that we've gotten so good at preserving battery through things like Bluetooth Low Energy and and all these new protocols of how you just preserve battery, these things that were previously these major limitations are kind of being circumvented left and right. And what that ultimately implies is that like what historically had been perceived as like, that's a non-starter. You'll never have a consumer device that can function quite like a hearing aid in certain regards, like the all-day battery life is, is actually becoming more and more feasible. So it's just helped to inform me of like what's actually possible when you understand all the various innovation that's taking place, both within this industry, but also adjacent in consumer technology, broadly speaking. Yeah, it's amazing. So uh, you're probably familiar with uh, what are cross hearing aids, which are uh, wireless transmitter uh, hearing aids to transmit hearing. And I say to people like, oh, I looked at a cross in 2005 and I always say to them, yes, but cell phones have come a really long way. Yeah. And all of the innovation in cell phones, battery life, rechargeables, all of that stuff. And we all just take it for granted, right? If my smartphone does all that stuff, of course, my hearing aid is going to do all that stuff. And so I think what you're saying is, is yes, but the hearing aid industry actually doesn't have the money or the resources to develop all that stuff de novo. It's a byproduct of these other industries driving it. And then the hearing space being a beneficiary of these great innovations, which is amazing. I I just don't think that people um, understood the gravity of what the implications would ultimately end up being of the made for iPhone hearing aids, because really what that did is it tethered it into the whole smartphone ecosystem, right? And so you have, you're able to now harness the power of the smartphone itself. Um, And then also now we're seeing the whole app economy be built. So you can see it like, 
The most obvious examples would, you, would be just the hearing aid manufacturers themselves and all of the apps that they have, which right. are becoming more and more robust. So you can have things like teleaudiology can be you know implemented and facilitated all through that. And I think that what really excites me, like I think, Mark, the, the next real frontier that like is going to just completely reimagine the way in which hearing aids are facilitated is as these things really start to get laden with sensors. And, and that for me is, you know, you had mentioned at the top, like biometric monitoring, that's one aspect of this, but I think that what we're realizing is like, um, the, one of the biggest advantages of a hearing aid from a passive monitoring standpoint, and a lot of that data that can be gleaned is that this is an all day device that has high compliance. You know, if you're wearing hearing aids, you're wearing them all day, you're, you're at least supposed to. And so as we see that there is all kinds of different ways that you can garner data. I mean, you're, you're now seeing so much in this link between hearing loss and cognitive impairment. Um, I think that you're going to start to really see some major um, forays into this space where you start to kind of laden on sensors that can do monitoring around cognitive impairment, you know, whether it's the microphones in which it's detecting speech and right. you're See building how much conversation you're having, right? Exactly. Really interacting with people, right? Exactly that. And then you can start to actually build these longitudinal data sets for all of these individuals. And so you look at it as, you know, I think that's kind of the, the broad wearables narrative as is right now. I mean, if you think about like the Fitbit being kind of the first wearable consumer wearable, if you will, um, it was a glorified pedometer and it took almost 10 years for, I think, wearables to really kind of come into their own. And what they've really rooted themselves in now is all around healthcare and on fitness monitoring and all this as they graduate into um, higher levels of sophistication of being able to capture data. And then now what's I think we're in the phase of is the actionable insights that's being implemented on top of all that data. And I think that we're seeing it at the risk now. You can see it with you know, everything from the Apple Watch to Whoop to Aura Rings. Um, I highly encourage people to go and look at some of the studies that are underway right now around just the detection of COVID and how the early diagnosis of, you know, they're basically saying that like, look, this is not intended to be a, um, a, a device that's, you know, going to necessarily flag every instance of it, but it is kind of that check engine light uh, example of there could be something going on with you. And, and these studies all are kind of coming out and showing that, that people are being uh, flagged by their aura ring or their whoop uh, wrist wearable 2.5 days before they're actually testing positive for symptoms. Right. So you kind of just like follow this trajectory out, not even necessarily for future pandemics or anything like that. But I think that think about the, 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 the demographic for um, hearing aids, you know, older adults, and then think of all the preventative health use cases that can be built on a device that's worn in your ear all, all day, every day. Position in space, all sorts of stuff. I mean, I, I'll give you a personal example. My my son is in an acapella group in his um, college awesome. and uh, he has an Apple watch and uh, he called me and he said, Hey dad, um, next time I'm home, can you take molds for hearing protection? I go, why? He goes, well, my Apple Watch keeps on telling me that I'm uh, being exposed to excessive noise. So I want, so he wanted, he, the watch remediated to him to get musician earplugs. See, and, I think this is so interesting. And that's an amazing like, story when you really think about such it. Such like, an, such an amazing story. Um, I think everybody that's probably listening to this podcast right now can appreciate the, there needs to be more public awareness of um, noise induced hearing loss. Perfect. And another good example, the dentist's office. Um, if you have an Apple watch, go in there, turn on your sound level meter and just show your hygienist when she's using the drill, how loud that is. And it's, again, I think just, it's one of these things that um, to kind of change topics a little bit and just talk about Apple um, that I think it's another one of these things that people are kind of um, not, are underestimating how dramatically influential Apple is right now on this industry, um, because you can see it in the way in which they're shaping um, the whole public sentiment around the way we perceive hearing health and, and in-the-ear devices, broadly speaking. I mean, you look around today, and we really are sort of in like the AirPods era, whether you like it or not. You go into 
I just recently was in the airport and everywhere you look, everybody has Bluetooth, you know, in the ear devices. And so I think that like, there's, there's something really important there, which is like, if one of the biggest detractors to hearing aid adoption has always been the stigma, well, what happens when we move into an era where it's really hard to distinguish why people are wearing what, you know, I think that you can look at a scenario where this guy over here is listening to a podcast, this person's streaming music, and this person's wearing something that looks just like those two devices, but they're using it for hearing augmentation. So I think that we're kind of entering into a really unique um, era that we've never been into before, where I think that we really have a real possibility where the stigma kind of starts to fall by the wayside because everybody is basically wearing things in their ears for prolonged periods of time, or at least a, a sizable portion of the population. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, not to, not to explore that too much, but I, I think we as an industry have oversimplified why people don't, you know, cost stigma. You know, it's like it's like if we have four buckets, we're we're doing well. And I, I think it's way more complex than that. I think it's a, a poorly understood entity by health professionals and a poorly understood entity by patients. But that that's a big topic. So yeah, that, that, that's really that's really cool. And so yeah, it's it's great stuff. Um, you know, where it's all going is a fascinating, fascinating world. So, you know, what are some of the top topics you've covered recently? Um, really, the, my podcast has uh, it's I, I so I have you mentioned I have this week in hearing, and then I also do uh, Future Ear Radio. So, Future Ear Radio is my podcast, and then this week in hearing I do with a number of other people. And um, this week in hearing is really intended to uh, just kind of shine a light on like all the different things. So you have two podcasts? Yeah. So, well, oh, my mistake. This, Sorry about that. no problem. This week in hearing is actually like a YouTube show mm-hmm. and um, it's really designed to shine a light on everything that's happening in the world of hearing, you know, broadly speaking. Um, and, and, and what my podcast has actually started to kind of revolve around is um, very much what hearing healthcare and, and the hearing professionals role in the future is going to look like. And so there's a lot of tech talk in it, but a lot of it now is kind of rooted around like in a world where the hearing health professional um, is facing a commoditization of their services um, and in their offering, how do you differentiate? And the reoccurring theme has been, you need to get back to the roots of audiology and actually look at the core differentiator is you, the hearing professional and all of the value that you can uh, provide off the back of that. And I think that the way in which I kind of see like the, you know, the origin of future ear and and what I'm doing now is really merging together is like, I think it's actually really important for hearing professionals to look at the consumer side of things and understand what's happening there and, and kind of like think through what can you do and bridge from that world and bring it into the world of hearing health. Because I think there's a lot of really important lessons to learn from, from the consumer side of things. You know, why is it that you have such large adoption of some of these different devices and the use cases that people are using them for aren't the best use cases for hearing aids. So right. would it, would you be better suited to position them sort of side by side? And, and maybe the narrative isn't really hearing aids are the end all be all hearing aids are just one part of your solution set. And and maybe the role of the audiologist and the hearing health professional in the future really ultimately becomes a, a guide to every solution that exists for all the different scenarios within your day. You look at, you know, the ways in which we now conduct business is so Zoom dominant. And so how, how much of that is, um, are you, are you talking about that in the patient consultation? What, what kind of setup are you using? Are there ways that you can optimize that setup? Because a hearing aid, a, you know, a Bluetooth hearing aid might not be the best thing for that. You might want something that does personalized audio that's specific for your digital uh, audio environment, which is just becoming increasingly more important. So I just kind of, I kind of look at um, the ways in which the hearing professional can differentiate themselves both through audiological services and doubling down on audiology, but also by looking at the consumer space and figuring out what bits and pieces can you take from there and apply them into your offering. Um, Because a lot of it is, we're having this like serious blending happening between hearing healthcare and consumer. It's becoming harder and harder to even distinguish what exactly does make a hearing aid 
so unique anymore? And I think that's an interesting question to kind of parse out. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, so what resonates is what I tell my patients all the time. And that is, I tell them, don't get hearing aids, get your hearing loss treated. Love that. Which is a, a, a totally different concept. And I think fundamentally, the hearing providers have to become solution providers, right? Not technology providers. And so, you know, it's pretty hard to compete when you just say, well, I, I'm, I'm a guy who uh, provides the technology, but I'm more expensive. Right. Um, right. I mean, you have to provide it's it's the knowledge and the experience that you provide that has to differentiate you. And and frankly, you know, if you really dig deep into the data, hearing loss isn't very well treated. So I think there's a lot of upside if you actually become a a um, a, a student of the art of treating hearing loss and really uh, go go into it. And so, um, I, you know, my my take on this, David, is, is that you know, those mid-level, lower quality people are going to be pushed out because they're not going to be able to differentiate themselves from going and getting an over-the-counter hearing aid. Um, you know, We're you're going not going to be able to charge 4X for that and give the exact same experience. And so yeah. that's really, I think, the challenge. Right. I mean, I think we are in, I think we're in a really interesting period right now because in my eyes, and, and again, I'm kind of an outsider. I'm not an audiologist. I'm just an observer. And like I said, I've kind of through osmosis and observation have kind of been at an arm's length from this whole industry since I was a kid. And I think that people have a tendency to dismiss when people say this time's different because it's like, well, we've heard that before. And it's like, well, eventually a broken clock is right. But I do think that there is a, a sort of a, a discounting of, of why this time is different. And it is very much because of the smartphone. It's very much because of the fact that like, this is now really the in-the-ear device is very much um, a, a byproduct and an extension of the, the smartphone ecosystem. Right. And I think that like you, you need to look at this. I love what you said about just like being, um, we're going to treat your hearing loss, you know, rather than we're not going to just like treat you with hearing aids. Because I do think that hearing aids play a very important role. And I think that they're actually going to take upon a, a whole different role as time goes on. It kind of goes back to what I was saying about the sensors. Right. I think I think that's actually part of the the future of what a hearing aid looks like. And I think that that's going to lead to some really interesting opportunities by the professional to make sense of that data and then take actionable steps on it, whether you're referring people out to, you know, um, you know, allied medical professionals, whatever that might be. Um, but I just see this as, you know, you, we're in this state right now where things are actually going to change quite significantly. And I think that the interesting thing is, you know, as I've, dug deeper into this and, and really kind of understood is like the actual value of the professional is in higher demand than it's ever been before. And so it's a matter of, it's not as if um, that like the, the audiologist per se isn't in demand. It's you have to figure out how to actually take that value and actively try to position it as part of your value proposition so that it's just like you said, you can't just say, I'm going to do the exact same thing that the big box retailer or the online retailer is going to do and charge you a premium. I have to actually differentiate in a meaningful way. And I think that's going to be able to, there will be lots of different ways in that, that this takes shape. Some people will really go the direction of, I'm going to just be a, a very boutique medical type offering that does a very comprehensive patient evaluation. Others will, I think, skew toward, I'm going to have a comprehensive offering that is going to be uh, a hybrid of hearing aids and hearables and all these other products. Um, but I think like at the end of the day, you have to figure out how do you take what makes you so valuable, which is your expertise and leverage that. And I do think that there's going to probably be some people that either are just going to be refusing to do that and will kind of stick their head in the sand. Um, or they're just not going to be able to figure it out. And those will probably be the the real, you know, Darwinian victims here, if you will. Um, but I think that on the flip side, I think that the professionals that do embrace this will see a, a more outsized impact in role than they've ever had before. Because I do think that there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of things that are really boding well for the professional as it relates to the broader medical ecosystem. Well, I mean, it's it's complex to navigate as long as people realize that they need help navigating it um, and you providing that navigation and great outcome. People want that. I mean, you know, um, why why were people I mean, it's a 
gross, you know, but why were people getting free flip phones before smartphones? And now they're willing to spend a thousand dollars for a mm-hmm. smartphone when you could do the same thing essentially, but it's not that it's, it's such a better experience that people see the value in it. And so it's a little bit harder in healthcare, but if you can demonstrate to people, you're giving them a better experience. Not everybody's going to embrace that, but I think there are plenty of people who will. And actually, you know, that's actually, I believe how the stigma will be eliminated. I mean, one of the stigmas of hearing loss or getting your hearing loss treated is how bad the experience is for people. Yeah. And how many people say this was terrible. I didn't hear any better. Um, you know, they were just trying to sell me something that is actually, to me, almost one of the biggest obstacles of more people because they, their experiences, their peer group doesn't have a good experience. So why should they even bother to go do anything about it? So right. I, I actually think that raising the, the quality will be uh, overall better for hearing losses. Yeah. I mean, I think that, um, you know, th- this is probably one of the biggest word of mouth sales. And so it cuts both ways. Like, if you provide an unbelievable experience, then chances are those people are going to go out and they're going to tell all their friends and that's going to be tremendously beneficial for you. But on the flip side, if you have a poor experience, then you're really at the whims of, of the feedback that's shared amongst their peers about that. So I agree with you fully on that. Well, that's great. You're really uh, in all of the intersection. And so what do you see is that, you know, I mean, obviously um, not to date this too much, but uh, there was talk of, uh, hearing aids being covered by Medicare with the Build Back Better, but that seems to not go, be going forward. So it's kind of interesting in our space. There's been a lot of dust kicked up, let's say, in the past uh, six to eight months. And then it seems like it's almost like settling and nobody's even talking about it anymore. I know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know what how that's all going to take shape. I think of, you know, what I do know is that the devices themselves are going to be... Um, they're going to be so much more capable of supporting broader and more robust use cases as time goes on. And so I think that, you know, what we'll really see is like, as I think that like the last like five years have been um, all like kind of build mode because it's, again, it goes back to this, like the DSP chips getting reaching parity with these ASIC chips and, and those dynamic chips are going to be um, capable of, of all kinds of things. Like you see, A really good example of this is that, um, you know, you have like these new AI processors that are being implemented in these systems on a chip. So you have like the Knowles AI processor um, that has recently been, you know, capable to be embedded on, you know, like Qualcomm's QC5500 or whatever it's called, the one that's the flagship hearable chip that's in all these devices. And so what that means is like, you can now have an AI processing, um, you know, you, so you have like the engine and then what you're going to see is you have these applications like chatable. Um, so I've gotten to know the CEO at chatable apps, the CEO there, Giles tongue. And the really exciting prospect there is like for the longest time in this industry, we've heard that one of the biggest challenges is speech and noise. Well, here's one way that you can maybe solve speech and noise is if you have the ability to take that sound and through you know, basically the AI processor, you're able to do these calculations and and run them through these algorithms in real time with almost zero latency, literally millions of times more powerful than anything that we've had in the past so that you're literally filtering that sound through machine learning algorithms and processors. And then it's coming back in real time and you're hearing it in your ears that's been filtered with all of the speech extracted. And so that to me is like, that's where things are going to get super interesting is like, that's what I mean when I say these chips are going to allow for more robust use cases is that as they become more power dependent or power independent, and they're able to function and process these kinds of, of use cases um, because of all of the infrastructure that's been percolating over the last five years, kind of unbeknownst to everybody, um, we're going to kind of suddenly see things that we've never seen before where you're going to say, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. You know, you see it in some of these demonstrations. If you look at companies like NVIDIA, you know, what they're doing with their, you know, it's a little bit different, but with their graphics processors, um, you know, these chips are like, they totally can just take sounds out in real time. They can, they can identify and filter out noises. And if you look at like what companies like Doppler Labs was trying to do all the way back in 2017, they were way ahead of their time 
you know, Doppler eventually went bankrupt, but they were basically alluding to these same things where you would be able to take, um, you know, the, uh, you would isolate an ambulance in a loud city and be able to take that noise through machine learning, identify it, and then basically say in the future, mute that noise for me. Um, and you would be able to do this for all kinds of different things. So I think that this whole idea of, of audio augmentation, um, in a weird way, like we keep hearing about, um, augmented reality, mixed reality, and all that, I will say probably the breeding ground for all of that is actually happening at the ear right now. You're actually going to see the most most sought after applications of augmented reality taking place at with with you know things like airpods and, and all these different in the ear devices because you really can augment your environment in a lot of different ways. Spatial audio is another good example of this where it's basically taking everything that exists and then remixing it in such a way that's desirable for the for the consumer. And so again, this is what I mean where it's like taking bits and pieces from the consumer world and applying it to hearing health. Like you can then look at this as maybe this is the solution for speech and noise is, you know, you look at this is what Facebook's trying to do. This is what Google's trying to do. They're basically saying, we're going to just throw a ton of processing power at this problem and, you know, you look at like Whisper, uh, Whisper, the hearing aid company, that's what they're basically doing. They have that, that brain, that standalone device that works in companion with the in-the-ear hearing aids. The whole point of that is so that you can process all of this in real time so that you can do things like, you know, really filter out that background noise so that you have more clear speech and noise conversations. So I think like that's a really long-winded way of saying that. I think over the next few years, those are going to be the major things that we kind of start to see come to market because it's now been made feasible, largely because of the infrastructure improvements that have been happening at the chip level that have been flying massively under the radar, in my opinion. Yeah, it's uh, by analogy, you see um, the the uh, smartphone ex- example where you take a picture and there's somebody in the picture and then you tap exactly. on them and they disappear. And so- it's extrapolating out what's behind there to fill it in. And it's smart enough to know that that's what you want totally to go away. And so great it's, example. It's, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, it's a great thing. So one of the questions I, I love to ask everybody is, is since we're in the sound, but what is your favorite sound? <laughs> what is my favorite sound? Um, <laughs> I like, uh, I have, I have five nieces. So just to mm-hmm. hear them laughing is, is definitely one of my favorite sounds. Um, so I, I would probably put that up at the top is just like little, my little ones laughing is, is definitely the, the sound of joy is, is up there. That's great. So, um, if, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they get, you've got two, two different uh, podcasts, it sounds like. So how do they find you? Yeah. So, um, you can connect with me on Twitter. I'm at Oak tree underscore Dave, um, on LinkedIn, Dave Kemp. Um, you can reach out to me via email, dkemp at oaktreeproducts.com. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned the, the, the blog future ear, uh, is the future ear.co is the blog. Um, the podcast is future ear radio, the YouTube show slash podcast that I do with a number of others. I want to make that clear. It's not mine. I, I just kind of co-founded it with, with a bunch of others is called this week in hearing. So check it on, on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like all over the different social channels. So um, I'm sure you can find me on, on one of them. No, that's great. So everybody, this has been Dave Kemp from Oak Tree. Uh, this has been really a, a really interesting um, interview. And I really appreciate you coming on today, Dave. It's uh, great to have you. Absolutely, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.